1977, the US National Bureau of Standards, now NIST, standardized an encryption method called DES as a federal standard. In the following years, it became the de facto international standard for data security in banking, telecommunications, and government. However, some suspicion was raised as the NSA made some last minute changes to the algorithm without explaining why. And the key size of only 56 bits was also considered rather low, even back then. Finally, in 1997, the first DES encrypted messages were broken publicly. Already one year later, the deep crack machine could brute force a DES key in 56 hours. In 1999, this time was reduced to under 24 hours. Today's estimates suggest that DES encrypted conversations can be decrypted in near real time. About 400 years earlier, the Visionaire cipher was developed. For more than three centuries, it was known as the indecipherable cipher, only to be substantially broken in 1863. Today, we are once again on the verge of another major inflection point. Widely used algorithms like RSA and AES are breakable or at least substantially weakened by quantum computers, possibly even soon. So this begs the question, will cryptography always be this cat and mouse game? Or would it be possible to have a truly, perhaps even provably, secure encryption method that cannot be broken, no matter what machine is used to try to break it? Hi and welcome to Premature Abstraction. Today we will talk about perfect secrecy and the one-time pad. Let's start by trying to define what we even mean by secrecy. An early view of secrecy was that the ciphertext should look random, meaning that there are no visible patterns. For example, the Visionaire cipher is secure in comparison to the Caesar cipher, as it encrypts doubled letters to different ones. The issue here is that humans are terrible at estimating randomness. Just because there are no obvious patterns doesn't mean that no statistical techniques can be used for analysis. Common reasoning in the mid 20th century was that only the key space needs to be so large that brute force is infeasible. While it is true that this is a necessary property, it is in no way sufficient as it ignores the construction of the algorithm itself. For example, the famous Enigma machine from World War I had such an infeasibly large key space but it could be broken with knowledge about the plain text distribution and its exploitable structure, restricting the effective key space size. Another contender as a definition for secrecy is that the encryption is not reversible without the key. This sounds reasonable at first, but it ignores that for many attackers, it is not necessary to exactly decrypt the message, but leaking partial information is already enough. A famous example of this is the ECB mode for an AES block cipher. You see here, encrypting this image with ECB mode was practically useless, as the relevant information comes across anyway. So true secrecy requires hiding all information, not just blocking exact decryption. That reminds us a bit of the last video, where we saw that the Visionaire cipher has an interesting property when the key is chosen uniformly and as long as the message itself, namely that it did not reveal any new information to an attacker when they intercepted a ciphertext, on top of simply guessing the message. And if we think about it, this is actually a really good candidate for defining what we mean by truly secret. So let's define perfect secrecy. We want that an attacker who intercepts our encrypted messages learns nothing from that. Formally, this means that an encryption scheme is perfectly secret if the probability that some specific message was sent, conditioned on the ciphertext that was observed, should be no different from the probability that this message would be sent in the first place. And this should hold for every message M and every ciphertext C. Now let's first look at that definition a bit. You may notice that this is an equivalent definition of statistical independence, namely that the ciphertext and the message are independent. Next, we did not put any assumptions on how powerful the attacker is. Even an attacker that has exponential computing power or a quantum computer cannot break it. Also, it is not hard to convince yourself that it is equivalent to say that for any two messages, the distributions of the two encrypted ciphertexts should be identical. This actually implies that the ciphertext contains no information about the plaintext. But this poses an interesting philosophical question. If the ciphertext contains no information and the key was chosen randomly, where is the information actually contained? Or where does it come from when the plaintext emerges during decryption? Post your ideas in the comments. There are, however, also some unfortunate implications that significantly restrict 
the options of what encryption algorithms we can even build to achieve perfect secrecy. First, all plain texts must be covered by keys, meaning that for a fixed ciphertext, there must exist a key that could have produced this ciphertext from any possible plain text. And another implication is that the key space must at least be as large as the message space. For fixed length keys and messages, this implies that the key must be at least as long as the message. So keeping this in mind, we will try to cook up an encryption scheme that is perfectly secret. But first, we want to get on the same page what kinds of messages we are even talking about. All our objects, so the plain text message, key and ciphertext are sequences of zeros and ones. This way, our algorithm is agnostic to what kind of data it actually processes. We can simply convert any text, image, audio file or whatever into zeros and ones using some format or encoding. A viable candidate for the encryption operation is the XOR operation. Given two input bits, it spits out a zero if the two bits are the same and a one when they are different. The symbol is similar to a plus sign as it effectively is regular addition in binary, but without the carry bit. We say it's a viable candidate because it fulfills the requirement that any cipher text could have come from any plain text with some key. It plays a very central role in all of cryptography because any input bit can be changed to any output bit. So let's just go for it and see what happens. As encryption, we simply X or all the bits from the message with the bits from the key element wise. Luckily, the XOR operation is its own inverse, so for decryption, we just do the same. The key cancels out and we get the original message back. This encryption scheme is called the one-time pad. Now, the only thing left is to prove that this scheme is actually perfectly secret, which we're going to do now. I know that proofs can often be off-putting, but I promise this one only has a few steps, which are all very straightforward if you know some basics from probability theory. Remember, we want to show this equality which is the definition of perfect secrecy. We start with this conditional probability. Using Bayes' rule, we can rewrite it like this. Now let's focus on the first part here. The event of getting ciphertext C given the message M is exactly the same event as getting C when encrypting M. So we insert the definition of the one-time pad and X or both sides with M to get this. To clarify, this expression means the probability of the key being exactly M, X or C. And since the key was assumed to be uniformly random, this is exactly 2 to the minus L, where L is the length of the key. Now onto the other part here. Using the law of total probability, we can rewrite it like this, summing over all messages. We did just analyse this first part here, so we know that it is 2 to the minus L. We can factor it out of the sum. Now this part is just the sum of the probabilities for all messages which of course sums to one, as the message has to be one of the possible messages. So it also simplifies to two to the minus L. Going back to the original expression, we can see that the two terms cancel out and we get exactly what we needed to prove perfect secrecy. Okay, great. You may think, why isn't the one-time pad used everywhere if it's that secure? Well, the problem is already in the name. A key may only be used exactly once. We can see what happens when we use the same key twice for different messages. An attacker can just build the XOR of the two ciphertexts, the key cancels out, and we are left with the XOR of the two plaintext messages, which of course can leak tons of information to the attacker. Consequently, the two parties must share the key first, which is as much effort as sharing the message in the first place, as they have the same length, and it must happen under the same security precautions. Also, all messages must have the same length, otherwise this is a side channel that may leak information. So even if you share keys beforehand, you also need to know in advance what kind of messages you are planning to send. This of course also assumes that the two parties even know beforehand who they want to communicate with. And if you recall the security proof, we also require the key to be truly uniformly random. Still, all these limitations don't mean that there are no practical applications of the one-time pad. For example, the hotline between Moscow and Washington during the Cold War was encrypted using the one-time pad the keys were printed on paper or tape and exchanged beforehand by a trusted courier and then instantly burned after use. It also gives good theoretical foundations to build more practical schemes on top. For example, the AES block cipher in counter mode can be interpreted as being a random number generator in combination with a one-time pad. This way, security analysis can focus on the AES part. The remaining security is already proven. 
But overall, most encryption schemes in use today are more on the we hope that it doesn't get broken tomorrow side. This has been Premature Abstraction. Thank you for watching.